you know, right? Um, so let me open up in prayer. Um, we can start that over here. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in your presence. We thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for this time in your word. Uh, Father God, uh, we believe that you, it's your desire to speak to us. Lord, I know that I'm a, a person uh, who's speaking and that I'm reading your word, Father. But I believe that your heart cries out to your people and that you have a message for your people, Lord. And that you, you, you cry out, Lord God, because you love us. And because your desire is to save us, Lord God. And, and, and for us to, to, to walk in you and to, and to clearly see, Lord, what it is you, you want us to do and, and how you want us to walk. And, and you, you don't want us to be in darkness. You don't want us to be wondering where, where we are, what's next, what's going on. You want us to, to walk with our eyes wide open, our eyes focused on you walking towards you, walking according to your will. And I believe your word will do that for us, Father. And I thank you for it, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, all right, so we'll get right into, into the word uh, that the Lord um, has put in my heart for everybody. And um, and so the, the title of the message, um, it's a real simple title. It's called The Heart. Right? The Heart, that's a title of, of what I feel God has put um, in my heart to share. Um, and and um, the heart is, uh, I, I believe that when we, when we gain a, a perspective of the heart, when we start to see things through, through the lens of, okay, how does this affect the heart, how does this touch the heart, it changes the way we view, like, for me, it's changed the way I view everything, I, you know, I literally heard a series and I, um, years ago when I, when I first started, you know, serving God, um, I heard a, uh, there was a series, there was a message, I heard a message about the heart, and then the, the minister, it was a guest speaker, he had a series, of, back then it was tapes, a tape series, um, and I listened to it, and it really, it, it and, and I don't credit to that message, right, but to the Word of God, and when God showed me His view of the heart, it changed the way I view things. It changed the way I see the Word of God, the way that God deals with us. And so I believe God wants us to have that revelation of, of how God sees the heart. Um, so let me start off. Um, well, we can start turning to Isaiah 55. If you have your Bible, Isaiah 55, um, verse 8. And um, as we go there, I, I do want to kind of, not, not so much get into it, but just a review. Uh, like I said, this is our third service. Uh, that we're meeting here, um, it just so happens that, you know, our church closed, and then right when that happened, then, you know, we're no longer allowed to congregate, so we were grounded because of our church closing, like, where are we going to go, and then, well, we can't go anywhere <laughs> because of, of the mandates, and so, so, so this is our, our third week of that, third week since the church closed, but also our third week of having to meet uh, through video, right? And so the first uh, message that I ministered uh, was about pastors, right? And again, focused on the tra uh, transitioning church, a church that just closed and now has members looking for a place to go. We talked about the importance of pastors and, and, and you know the, the role that a pastor has in a believer's life and how important that is to to be mindful of it. Uh, that a pastor is supposed to, you know, feed his sheep. And we, so we, we got into the, the pastor. And then the second week we talked about um, iron sharpens iron. We talked about the members of the church, the importance of, of going to church because of the church members and the work that happens there. Now, the thing that I, the reason why I want to bring it up is, is that there's a folk, both of them, both of those two messages have a, a focal point, which I guess in my mind it was like it goes without saying, even though it was mentioned, but the pastor is somebody that Jesus gives to us, right? So in other words, it's not about the pastor. It's not about the relationship with the pastor. It's about Jesus and our relationship with him, right? Same thing with as iron sharpens iron. We, we talked about how, you know, it's not just throwing iron together, but, you know, there's a work being done. There's a specific work being done. There's somebody behind the scenes working that relationship to work for our good, and that's Christ, right? So it's not just, uh, you know, we need a pastor and we need to go to church. It's not that. It's we need to, to be in relationship with Christ 
And Christ will bring us a pastor. Christ will use people to, to mold us, to shape us, to guide us. Right? And so the key is Christ. The key is Jesus. Right? And what He's doing in our lives. That's the key to those two messages, to this message, and every message that matters. Is, it goes back to Christ and to Jesus, to His work on the cross, and to His will for our lives. Um, so, so I want us to be thinking about Jesus and His perspective. So if we go to Isaiah 55, um, Isaiah 55, and verse 8. Alright, so we're talking about the heart. Right, the title of the message is the heart, and that's our focus. Right, and we're gonna and we're gonna look at at um, you know how God views the heart. But before we look at that, we need to understand Isaiah 55 verse 8. Um, this is a scripture that many people are familiar with. Uh, Isaiah 55 8 says, "My thoughts." Okay, so I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. So in, in the New Living, it reads it, "My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts." says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine, right? And so, so, so some translations say, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are, are not your ways. And then verse 9 says, for just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts, right? So before we even start to to look into this, before we start to understand what this message is about, we need to realize that we're not talking about what you think about the heart. We're not talking about or, or what, what I think about the heart, what Robert thinks about the heart. You know, we're not talking about, you know, man's view of the heart. Right? We don't want to know what Dr. Phil thinks or what Dr. Oprah or whatever all, all that stuff works. I don't even know what are the current what are the current uh, shows that people Ellen or whatever. <laughs> we're, we're not interested in what they think about the heart. We're not interested in what you know um, psychologists, you know, books have written about the heart. We're not interested in that, right? So, so right now, because it says my thoughts are not your thoughts, right? God is saying His thoughts are not our thoughts. If we pursue the heart and the study of the heart in our own thinking, in our own understanding, we're already wrong. We're already off course. Right? I know that this room is filled with super intelligent people and those watching as well. You know, we're, we're, I, I you know, have no, th th mean no disrespect to anybody, but our intelligence, our ability to understand is useless in the things of God. Right? So we need to write away. I mean, so I, I get it that, you know, like I said, there's very intelligent people, very accomplished people, you know, who, who have proven their, their ability to reason and to understand, right? But that doesn't help you when you're looking at the things of God. I mean, I'm saying it doesn't help you, but it's not going to get you there, right? God can use that. God can use your knowledge. God can use your ability to reason. He can use all that. But He uses that. That doesn't determine, you know, God's view. We can't use our understanding to figure God out. It's the flip side. God can use our understanding to help us see Him clearer. Right? But anyway, so the first thing we have to do is we have to throw out our thoughts. We have to throw out our way of reasoning. We have to start from ground zero, from nothing. Right? I don't understand. I don't know. Once we get there, then God can start to, okay, now I have something to work with. As long as we're hanging on to, well, I know this and I think this, then we're um, giving God, there's an obstacle between us understanding God's view. So the first thing we need to understand is that God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Our thoughts are not going to help us completely grasp what God is trying to tell us. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so um, and I want you to keep your place here in Isaiah 55. We're going to come back to it in a little bit. Um, but I want us to turn to uh, 1 Samuel uh, 16. 1 Samuel Chapter 16, verse 7. First Samuel 16, verse 7. And this is, I'm not going to go through the whole story, but this is where, where Samuel is looking for a new king for, for Israel, where God tells Samuel that he's rejected Saul, he's rejected um, 
um, Saul as king, and so now he wants David to be the king. Um, and well, so he sends Samuel to go look for a king, right? And so Samuel starts looking through uh, the the family, um, uh, looking at all, at all the brothers, right? Who, who God is saying one of them is going to be uh, going to be the king, all right? And so so uh, I'll just go real quick to uh, seven. Um, okay, well, let me go to to eight to six, right? Just to because I already gave a little bit of context. So in verse six, it says, "When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab, right, and he thought, surely this is the Lord's anointing, anointed, right? Because he saw this guy, you know, he's looking for a king for Israel, and, and just from viewing, uh, you know, just from his appearance, you know, Samuel says, surely this is the Lord's anointed. And then verse seven is the one that we want to look at. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel." Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Right? So the Lord, when he's judging, when he's looking at a circumstance, he's not looking at what's happening or what, what's what, what people are doing or how people look or, or you know, how they you know, hold themselves. He's looking at the heart, right? If we learn to do that, we would see things a lot differently, right? right? And the first thing we would understand is that we don't always know the heart, right? We don't always know the heart. So that alone would put us dependent on God, right? But so, we, so here the Word of God is telling us that God's thoughts are different than our thoughts, right? And it's telling us that man's thoughts, they look at the outward. They look at the circumstance. They look at what's happening. They look at what you can see. And based on what you can see, they're making a judgment. They're determining what they're going to do or how to assess that situation, right? But God doesn't do that. God looks at the hearts of people, right? He looks at the, their hearts, and, and through that, he, he assesses, right? And that's not just saying that we are to judge our circumstance by people's hearts. It's also saying, and we'll see that in the Word, that as we're judging, as we're assessing our situation, we need to constantly be looking at our own hearts. If we fail to do that, then we fail to discern the things of God. We fail to judge our own hearts. So, so in First Samuel it says that God judges, that God looks at the heart, right? He doesn't look at the outward appearance. And then, real quick, we'll go to John chapter seven. Um, John chapter seven, verse twenty-four. John 7, 24 says, let's see, um, just give, again, to give context, this is a, a, basically an argument, or, or Jesus is being questioned, right? Um, and so, I'll start, I'll start on 21, right? But the, the, the scripture we're looking at is verse 24. But I'll, I'll go to 20, uh, John 7, 21. Um, you know, um, there, people are, are testing Jesus, or they're, they're you know, questioning him. And Jesus replied, he said, I did one miracle on the Sabbath, and you were amazed, right? But you work on the Sabbath too, when you obey Moses' law of circumcision. Actually, this tradition of circumcision began with the patriarchs long before the law of Moses. For if the correct time of circumcision, circumcising your son falls on the Sabbath, you go ahead and do it so that, as to not to break the law of Moses. So why should you be angry with me for healing a man on the Sabbath, right? So, so there's an argument, right? And they're, they're judging Jesus, and Jesus saying, okay, you judge me because I, I healed somebody on the Sabbath, right? But you also do things on the Sabbath because it conflicts with another law. And so you're, you know, saying, well, I'm doing wrong because I broke this law. And then you break the same law, but, you know, in your eyes, you do it right. And so in, in verse 24, he says, in the New Living Translation, he says, look beneath the, surf the surface so you can judge correctly. Right? So, he, so, so the reason why I wanted us to make sure that we look at this is because it's in red letters, right? It's Jesus speaking, right? Jesus is saying to us. So, so first we said, you know, that God's thoughts are not as our thoughts, right? He thinks, you know, higher than, than the way we do. And then we saw in Samuel where, where the way he sees things is he doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart, right? Mm -hmm. That's God's perspective. But now in John, Jesus is saying to us, is saying to the people, now he's saying you look beneath the surface so that you can judge correctly. Right? So this isn't just what God does and, oh, okay, yeah, let's admire how God does things and let's just, you know, understand God better. He's commanding us to do the same. 
Right? It's not just about well, how God sees things because, well, his thoughts are over there, mine are over here, so mine are going to be, you know, carnal, or mine are going to be, you know, earthly. He's saying, no, you need to do the same. You need to judge things beneath the surface. Don't just look at what's happening and react to it right away. And just based on that, you make your decisions, right? I believe this is a word from the Lord. I pray that God is speaking to your heart right now. Um, because God wants to heal our hearts. God wants our hearts to be in a certain condition in order to be able to get us to the next place. In order for us to be walking through this time of transition, to this time of craziness. In order for us to get through this and grow and thrive and, and be, become even greater, uh, do greater things for God than we've even done before. We need to protect our hearts through this. If we fail to do that, we fail to reap the benefit right, of the victory, right, the victory that God has for us. Right? So... God is, is saying we need to um, look beneath the surface, right? Don't just judge things by how, how you see them, right? And so, so let's go back to Isaiah uh, 5. Wait, no, Isaiah 55. I wrote Isaiah 55. It's Isaiah 55. So, so the heart, right? The heart is a big deal. The heart is, is a big thing, right? It's, it's the focus of what we're talking about today, but it's also something that God looks at. Right? God determines the heart, right? He doesn't, he, you know, and, and there's a lot of times that we might see something in, and I think this is very uh, relevant as far as us being in transition and talking back about real life church closing and us thinking, why did this happen? Why did that happen? And again, it doesn't have to be, you know, we don't have to be from real life church. We don't have to be experiencing that to get this word because a lot of us ask why. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? And a lot of times, instead of just leaving the question and bringing it to God and allowing God to either answer or, you know, leaving us in waiting for an answer, a lot of times we fill in the blanks, right? Oh, well, why? Well, oh, because probably this, and oh, probably that. Or you know what? I saw this, or I noticed that. Or you know what? I heard this, I heard that. And then we, with our own thinking, with our own understanding, we start to fill in the whys. If we do that, we don't take it before God, but we do it based on what we heard, what we think, what we've experienced before, those thoughts are going to get us to an incorrect picture, right? To a picture that's not going to help us, but it's going to hurt us, right? A lot of people are walking around hurt. Their hearts have, you know, <coughs> battle scars. They have wounds because they've judged things incorrectly, right? They've filled in the blanks and decided, well, it's because this, because of that, because of... You know, and that's why they did this, and that's why this happened to me. And, that, and, and it, oh, what it does, it creates bitterness in the heart. And so we judge incorrectly people's hearts, and that causes us to walk with a damaged heart. Mm -hmm. Right? The only way to undo that, right, is to see clearly, to allow God to start working. To, to, like I said, before we, start, before we started, the, started the message, I said, we need to understand that our thoughts are not going to help us, so we need to throw our thoughts aside, right? Same thing with our hearts. You know what? Maybe our hearts have, have deceived us, right? So we need, to, we need to be willing to throw that aside. So you know what, God? Show me. Teach me, right? Um, and just so you know, this is, this is a recurring theme in this message is this, you know, show me, teach me. I don't know. Basically, it's repentance, right? It's coming to the ground zero to like, I don't know. I don't understand. God, I need you. To show me, I need you to, to to let me see things clearly, right? Mm -hmm. So going back to Isaiah 55, um, verse 8, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back a couple of verses. Um, I'll go to verse 6, right? In verse 6, so, so we're talking about the heart, right? And in verse 6 of Isaiah 55, it says, Seek the Lord while you can find him, right? And I think this is a very timely word for us right now, being in in what do you call it? Um, in um, not isolation, but quarantine. quarantine, and you know, be, be and being isolated. But it, it says, seek the Lord, right, while you can find Him. Seek, seek Him now while you can, right. Call on Him now while He is near. Verse seven: Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord, that He may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to God. For he will forgive generously. And then it goes into my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. My ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. So actually the context of these of this scripture of God saying that my thoughts are not your thoughts is 
repentance, or it's where it says, let them, let those who don't walk according to let them turn to the Lord, that He may have mercy on them. Right? And it says, yes, turn to our God, for He will forgive generously. Right? In other words, it says that, that forgiveness for God, that He has more than enough forgiveness. You cannot run out of God's forgiveness. You, you can't go to God so many times and ask forgiveness so much where it's like, okay, you know, that's, I have no more forgiveness to give you. Right? Sure, you can sin and then ask for forgiveness and then sin and then God, the same sin again and ask for forgiveness and do that so many times where you kind of burn yourself out where you can't numb yourself from even repenting. You don't numb God out. But you might, you know, if you keep going back to your sin, then basically you're, you're watering down your act of repentance, right? But that's on you, right? It's not on God. God is ready for an open heart who's, who's asking for true forgiveness, even though it's the 150th time he's ready to forgive, right? It says that God forgives generously. Praise God for that. I am a person who can appreciate how much God can forgive. Because I've done so much that, you know, He shouldn't forgive. Right? That if God wasn't the God that we're describing today, if God was a God who judged on the outside, if God was a God who, um, who saw things the way people do, I would not be, you know, here. I would not be alive. I would not be... Um, Christian, I would not be able to walk with God because my personal sin has disqualified me from everything having to do with God according to man's eyes but not according to God's eyes. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. Right? Praise God that, his, that He will forgive generously. Right? And it's important for us to, to understand uh, that generous forgiveness, right? Um, and actually, I, I, now I'll get into a little bit um, my testimony, right? My story, or why I say that, right? And I'm not going to go into my whole story, but, um, you know, many know, or those who know me well know that, that when I was younger, um, I was very different than how I am now, right? Some people, you know, don't recognize the one from the other, right? Because... Um, because I went through a lot of trials in my life. I went through a lot of, of hard years and, and I committed a lot of sin in my life. I committed sin and, um, and, and, and you know, to me, it got me to the point of, of where I was a drug addict, right? Where I was doing drugs, where I was an alcoholic, where I was drinking every day, uh, where I was um, in bad relationships. Right, where I, where I, you know, had sex before marriage, and you know, completely um, dishonored that the you know um, marriage and relationships and all that. You know, I just I, I lived a life that was very dishonoring to God, right? But if you asked me if I was a good person, if you were to ask me back then, if you were to ask me if if I was. Uh, um, a good person, I would have said, yeah, I am a good person. You know, and the reason why is because, because besides everything that I did, a lot of things happened to me as well, right? And, and in my mind, it was like, you know, because, um, you know, when I was young, I was molested, right? I was molested when I was young, right? And I don't say that, you know, to, you know, um, to you know, have something interesting to say. I say it because it's it's a fact, right? Of how I grew up, right? I was molested as, as I was young. I grew up uh, in a in a family where there was an alcoholic, right? My father was an alcoholic, and I grew up that way, right? I grew up, uh, you know, uh, seeing my father that way, experiencing, you know, seeing my dad be taken to jail, uh, you know, literally our house being raided by police, you know, guns. You know, police pointing guns at us, right? Because we were in the house, you know, coming in and, and, and raiding the house, police cars everywhere, them taking my dad out in handcuffs and then him going away to prison, right? I, I, I experienced going to visit him, right? You know, at the, at the county jail while they, before he went to prison, 
uh, you know, through the, the through the thick glass and, and and you know through a phone and you know talking to him like that. I, I experienced these things, right? So in my mind, because I was molested, because I was I grew up in an alcoholic family, because life handed me. We were poor. We were. We didn't have, you know, the things that everyone else had. You know, there were so many excuses, so many reasons why I was a drug addict, why I was the way that I was, that, that in my own mind, my sin was justified. Like, I could explain why, right? And a lot of times we do that. A lot of times we see somebody struggling, we see somebody in sin, and we justify it. Right? We oh well, oh, you know, they went, they had a hard life, they had this, they had that, you know, that's the reason why. And so we excuse it away, right? A lot of times we do that for ourselves. We we make excuses, right, for for our own sin, for the things that we've done wrong, the things that we need to be forgiven for, right? As long as we're making excuses, as long as we're reasoning why we sin, we're never gonna go and ask for forgiveness. Right, and so I remember I, this. Is, this was my condition, right? Drug addict, you know, being in all this, in all this kind of sin. When I came to hear the gospel, right? When I went into a church, and in that church, I heard the message that Jesus came to Earth. You know, He was God, and He came to Earth, and that He took all my sin on Himself and was crucified. He was found guilty, even though He was innocent. And he was crucified, and all of my sin was put on him, right? And because he was crucified, he paid for my sin, right? And that's why he has, you know, he's generous with forgiveness, because the sin has been paid for. And when, when, when I saw that, all my excuses went away. Like, God took away every reasoning, every, everything, and all I could see was me and my acts towards God. One thing that we need to understand about sin is that sin isn't about a list of things that we're supposed to do or not do. Like we need to get that because a lot of, you know, as a minister, especially when I was a youth pastor, I would always get people asking me, hey, is it a sin if, you know, if I get stopped by the cops and they tell me, you know, why are we speaking a lie to him? And, or is it a sin if, you know, my mom says, you know, um, how do I look? And then, you know, she doesn't look that great, but I tell her, yeah, you know, so I laugh. Like, they would all, people would always ask me, is, is this a sin? Is that a sin? And, you know, just, you know, if I do this or I do that. Sin is not about a list of things that I'm supposed to do right or not do. And, you know, it, it's not a list of things to do. Sin is about a relationship with God. That's why the Bible says that sin separates us from God. Not because God is going to reject you because you weren't good enough. You're either good enough or you're not good enough. And that's going to determine God's acceptance or rejection. Sin is about us living apart from God. Living in a way that doesn't honor God. Living in a way, doing things that we know God doesn't, um, that doesn't approve of, but we do it anyway. Right? And so we break relationship. That's what sin, sin is, that broken relationship. Right? That's what sin goes, goes back to. And so when... when when God brought that to my attention and said, you know, it's not about all your excuses. It's not about all your reasons why. It's not about this happened, that happened. What about my neighbor? What about the way this person acts? What about the way that person acts? It was about me and my heart. And God showed me a picture of my own heart. And I had no excuse. I had zero excuses. I had nothing that I could say to God, well, I did this because of that. Like, there was nothing but God, I sinned before you. I am wrong. When I got to that point, then that's where God was like, okay, now we can start. When I got to that point where all these excuses were thrown away, right? Praise God for Jesus. Praise God for His work on the cross. Praise God for our ability to come to Him and to have our sin be put on the cross and to be walking in forgiveness. Praise God for that. And I hope that we have an appreciation for that. I hope that if you've already given your life to Christ, that you know this. And if you haven't, that you know you can have this. You can have this forgiveness. You can have this sin wiped out of your life. And no longer walking in rebellion from God, but walking in, in a communion, in relationship with Him. A personal relationship with God. Right? And there's a reason why I'm kind of bringing this up because... 
So, so praise God for that forgiveness, right? So, so now we're going to kind of transition a little bit. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 6, right? Praise God for the forgiveness uh, for our sins. Oh, well, actually, wait. Before we go there, uh, just to kind of finish off as far as uh, my personal testimony, go to 1 John, right? So what I did when I found out that I had no excuse, that my sin was my sin, and that I couldn't blame it on my neighbor, and I couldn't compare myself to anybody else, but to my to me before God, then, you know, according to, to 1 John 1, verse 8, it says, when we find ourselves in that condition, it says in verse 8, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth, right? That's where I was before, right? Where I justified my sin. But once my justification were taken away, then, then I had to admit my sin. So verse 9 says, But if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. He is faithful and just. Right? I think I've been making this point, but it's here in the Word of God that if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, not only to forgive us, but to cleanse us from all wickedness. That means all the sin that we did in the past is gone, and He cleanses us from having to live in that sin anymore. We're no longer bound to addiction, to be, you know, um, alcoholism, addiction to, to different things, right? We're no longer bound to the sin, mm -hmm. right? But now we're set free. Now go to Colossians chapter 3. Again, this is still closing off the testimony. Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. Colossians 3, verse 11. And I'm going to read through 15. It says, When you came to Christ, you were circumcised. Not by physical procedures. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision. The cutting away of your sinful nature. Right? So verse 12 says, For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with Him you were raised to new life, because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Verse 13, You were dead because of your sins, and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for He forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by His victory over them on the cross. Hallelujah. So Jesus did this. When we confessed our sins before Him, God took all of our sins away. He nailed them to the cross. Some of you might not be able to appreciate it the way that I can, but I have been in before a judge. I, I once had to do an application where I had to fill out, you know, I had to figure out how many times I've been arrested, how many times I've been in jail. I, I, I lost count at 12. Right? There's more than 12 times that I've been before a judge um, having to deal with different things, right? But I know what it feels like to be standing before a judge and for the judge to say, Robert, you've been found guilty of drink, uh, drinking and driving, you came out positive on a drug test, uh, you didn't pay your, your fees, uh, you, you uh, were, were stopped while you were on probation. You know, all, all, a list of crimes before I, I've been there where I have a list of crimes before me. Right? So this is saying the charges that were brought against you, the charges that God brought against you, were taken away. All of, Yes, you're found guilty, but Jesus paid the price for you, so you're going to be declared innocent. Right? I, I can appreciate that from that perspective, right? But we've all been through that. If we've given our lives to Christ, we've all had our charges wiped away. Right? And again, praise God. For his forgiveness. Praise God for him looking at our hearts and looking at Jesus and the work on the cross and forgiving us. Because of Jesus, we receive forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, an awesome message. It's awesome to realize. It's awesome to understand. Because when God forgave us, 
He no longer, he not only forgave us because he's generous in forgiveness, but he, he didn't just say, okay, you're forgiven. What God did is he gave us forgiveness. Right? And that's how God does things. God doesn't just love us. He doesn't just give us love and say, I love you. But God gives us love. No. Right? What's the difference between the two? Right? The difference is, when God forgives us, that means, God, I did wrong. I, I'm guilty. Everything that I did, it's true. And I ask you to forgive me. And He gives us forgiveness. Which means that we're forgiven for that. But then we're empowered to forgive others. No. Not because of it was justified or not justified because you know what all they meant it they didn't mean it. Not because of any of that. But because of Jesus' work on the cross. When somebody offends us, when somebody sins against us and breaks relationship with us, we've been empowered not to look at their sin, not to look at what they did, not to look at why this happened, but to look at Christ on the cross. To look at His sacrificial work and say, because of Jesus, I can forgive my father for being an alcoholic, those who molested me, the, you know, anybody who sinned against me, I can forgive them because I have not only been forgiven, but I have been given forgiveness. No. God gives us forgiveness, so it's really easy to get excited about Jesus forgave me, yay, Jesus, you know, He, as bad as I was, He forgave me, right? We can say that, but now... We're saying that God gave that to us mm -hmm. to be able to forgive others, mm -hmm. to set others free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why did the pastor close the church? Why did you know? Why did the people do more? Why didn't this happen? Why? 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 God has empowered us to look at the cross and get rid of all the whys and say, "I forgive." Starting from ground zero, I forgive. I start with forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Right. So in Matthew chapter 6, um, verse 12, and I'll start in verse 8, um, um, just to, you know, to bring, con bring context, everybody's familiar with this scripture. Um, Matthew 6, um, I'll start in 8, it says, uh, don't be like them, right? It's talking about the Pharisees, talking about people who pray, you know, just babbling words. He says, don't be like them, for your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Right? So in this prayer where, where Jesus is condensing all prayers into one, right? They're asking them, you know, how, or he's saying this is how you should pray. In there, he says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us, right? And Jesus isn't saying, well, for God to follow our example. He's not saying, well, because we forgive, then you can forgive us, right? But he's giving this cycle that happens, right? We receive forgiveness, we give forgiveness. We receive forgiveness, we give forgiveness. Our ability to forgive is based on the, the forgiveness that we have received. That's a huge, huge thing to understand. Thank because you. our thoughts are not His thoughts, right? In other words, there is a carnal forgiveness. There is a forgiveness that is earthly, that is carnal, that is not of God. And that forgiveness is, okay, if you did something, okay, it's justified, I understand you did it, just don't do it again, right? And I'm going to forgive you, but I'm not going to trust you, I'm not going to, you know, um, I'm going to forgive, but I'm not going to forget. And I'm not saying to let yourself be taken advantage of, but if, we, if you have that conditional forgiveness, it's not the forgiveness that the Bible talks about. So there's a way, there, there's a forgiveness that isn't Christ's forgiveness. Christ's forgiveness is unconditional. It's like, you know what? You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not judging you based on your heart. I'm judging you based on my heart. My heart says forgive. Amen. Right? My heart says forgive. Right? Sure, we hold people accountable. Sure, we, when somebody does something wrong, we hold them to it, right? They, they need to make up for what they've done wrong as far as, you know, somebody, you know, whatever, they, they, they stole money, you know, they stole money from you. They need to pay you back, right? You need to hold them accountable. You can't, you know, 
um, make excuses for them. We do have to hold people accountable, but that's different, right? That means that you love them so much that you don't want them to keep sinning. You love them so much, you don't want them to feel like it's okay to steal. You love them so much, you don't want them to walk around thinking it's all right to take advantage of people. You love them so much that you're going to hold them to what they did. That's different. When you, when you forgive, you do it out of love, right? But it's not saying, okay, well, no, you know, once, if you pay me back, I'm going to forgive you. Or if you do this, I'm going to forgive Or if, 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 if. You know, if we're forgiving the, according to Christ's blood, all the ifs are out. And I'm just going to forgive, right? And then everything we do after that is out of love. Right? Um, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 14. So, so praise God for His forgiveness. Right? Praise God for the forgiveness that He has given us, right? That we, that we are forgiven, right? But praise God for Him empowering us to forgive, right? 2 Corinthians. I didn't write the chapter. So I have to figure out what chapter it is. Saint Corinthians. Um, and then, oh, um, Saint Corinthians. St. Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, it says, Either way, Christ's love controls us, since we believe that Christ died for all. We also believe that we have all died to our old life. Verse 15 says, He died for everyone, so that those who receive His new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped the value. Okay, so right, so what, it, what it's saying, right, is that we understand, and it's easy for us to, to say this about ourselves, right? Well, we've died, you know, we've died. You know, we, we, we've asked God to forgive us. We've been crucified with Christ, so we have died to sin. And so now, you know, we live according to Christ, right? We, 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 we judge things according to the way God leads us, right? It's easy to say that about ourselves, right? But, but others, it's a little bit harder, right? And, 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 and I've seen it over and over again where, where somebody will say, you know, the Lord showed me this or the Lord told me this or, or I'm doing this because the Lord is leading me to whatever. And then, I'll, and then right away, well, wait a minute. And then, and then people start to judge that and think, wait, what's the real intention? What's the real motive? Why? Like, you know, it's even happened with me about um, this ministry, right? It's like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this ministry to help to bless the people of, of real life church. Oh, well, you know, why, why did Robert do that? Like, what was he trying to do? What's, what's the reason? What's the purpose for it? Right away, we start to think with earthly thoughts. But it says here in the Word of God, it says, verse 16 says, So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, how differently we know Him now, right? So there's a, a human point of view of judging people, right? Of judging why people do things and how they do it. And the Bible's saying that as believers, especially when we're dealing with other believers, we should stop judging each other from the human point of view. Yes, we all make mistakes. Yes, we all, you know, have those weaknesses where we do things selfishly, where we do things for the wrong reasons. But the Bible is saying that as believers, we're not supposed to judge from that um, perspective. And this is what I mean by that. All of us have flaws. And we all have things that we do wrong. Right? That we've done wrong and that we do wrong. And any of us can be judged just by those things. And if we're judged just by what we've done wrong, just by the mistakes we've made, well then you know, that's, that's a horrible picture. Right? That, that, you know, anybody who would judge any of us, Anybody by that measure would be, you know, they would come out as a, as a bad person, right? And the same token, all of us have had our, you know, 
moments of, of doing things for God, of doing things unselfishly, of doing things for others, of being a blessing, of being used by God. And, and so if we judge by those things, well, then we have a, a, a picture, right? A, a, good, a picture of a good person, right? The Bible is actually telling us, judge according to that. Judge according to the good. Not, not that we ignore the mistakes, but we see the potential that people have. We see what they can be in our lives. This is such a big, if we get that, we will treat each other different. Right? You know, we, we do have flaws, right? And, and it is, uh, you know, um, we can be justified in, in judging somebody because they made a mistake. Right? We can say in our, in our earthly thinking, well, they did this, right? So I'm not going to trust them anymore. Right? The Bible says, don't judge that way. Expect more of people. Hold a higher standard. Have a greater expectation. And people will come up to meet your expectation. We're so quick to dismiss people. We're so quick to say, well, no, last time they messed up, so I'm not going to let them do that again. But we're so quick to say, you know, okay, they've already done this. They've already did a pattern of this negative behavior. You know, they're, they're crossed out in my book. We should always be trusting God to be working in the lives of people. And the, the thing about that is that if we're going to trust God, then we better start praying for those people. We better start praying for the, the, the ones that we're not too sure about. Right? Because there are some people like that. Some people like, you know, not too sure about their abilities, right? I'm not saying let yourself be taken advantage. I'm just saying we have to give people chances. We have to give people, chance, give people chances and view people through the perspective that God Verse 16 again says, So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. We stopped judging people that way. At one time, we thought of Christ really from a human point of view. We, we, we in our minds, we, we analyzed who Jesus was based on our own way of thinking. How differently we know Him now. Now that we've been given forgiveness, now we see Jesus in a totally different light. Um, and so, and so again, God has not only forgiven us, but He's empowered us to forgive. Just like we, you know, um, we ourselves were in sin and were not worthy of forgiveness. God's forgiven us, and He's given us the ability. When somebody else is seemingly unworthy of forgiveness, we are empowered to be able to give them forgiveness. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's go to um, Ephesians chapter five. It's got a couple more scriptures to go over. Ephesians chapter 5. I believe this is, like I said, a timely word, a specific word. I believe that we're going through a time in our lives where hanging on to unforgiveness is going to have consequences. We've been able to, in the past, get away with it. Maybe years ago, we, we didn't forgive, and we've hung on to that. And, and, and we've been able to get by with that unforgiveness, we've been able to get through whatever circumstances. We're approaching a time in the church, in the world, things are changing, things are going to be different. I don't believe things are ever going to go back to normal. I believe that God is doing a new thing, that you're going to end up in a totally different you know, life than you did before, and that things are going to get tested. And right now is our time. Like I said, it's a trying time. Right now is the time to evaluate our hearts and to, to deal with any unforgiveness that we might have. But we can't do it on an earthly thinking. We have to get to ground zero. And say, God, I don't know. I don't know whether I'm, um, if I have unforgiveness or not. Do I, God? Show me. I'm willing to admit that I may have unforgiveness. That's where it starts. But if we're not, if, oh, I know, I'm not, I, I know, I always forgive, I always forgive. You know, and then we start there, then there's no hope. Then, you know, how, how can God work in our hearts when that's our stance? I don't need God. I, never, I, I don't need God in this area because I always forgive. We need to get to this place where we're like, God, show me. Ephesians chapter 5. Um, I'll go to... Verse 6, sorry, verse 6. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6. He says, Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse their sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey Him. Right? So this is where I mean, like, I'm not saying that we let people take advantage of us or we just let people get away with things, right? 
But we need to trust that God will take care of it. God will. We won't. Unless God leads you to do something, you do what God needs you to do. But it's not your job to hold people accountable for their sins. Right? It's not your job. So don't be fooled by those who try to excuse their sins and don't be one of those people. For the anger of God will fall on all who disobey Him. Don't participate in these things these people do, right? So you don't be one of those making excuses for your sins. For once you were full of darkness, but now if you've given your life to Christ, now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you, uh, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Verse 10. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful to even talk about these things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And then verse 15, it says, So... Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like, those, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord is telling us to walk according to His Spirit, right? But the part I wanted to really focus on was verse 15, where it says, So be careful how you live. It's saying, be careful, which means be intentional. Some translations say, so walk circumspectly. Right? Circumspectly means that you're you know, like a circumference, right? You're looking around, you're watching out how you're walking. You're, you're judging yourself. You're measuring yourself saying, am I doing this with the right heart? Am I doing this in the right way? That like we're judging ourselves by our hearts. God is telling us to do that in the decisions that we make and how we're walking. Right? And I'm going to close with Psalms uh, 139. So the Lord wants us at this time to be very mindful of our intents, of, of you know, the, the condition of our heart, right? Uh, Psalm 139. So, so we started by, by talking about how God uh, sees things, right? And how God, the way He sees things is He looks at the heart, right? Not at the outward circumstance, but He looks at the heart, right? He judges things by heart. And how we need to do the same thing. Jesus tells us, you know, you need to look below the surface, right? Surface, you need to look at the heart, right? And, and in saying that, he didn't, he, he didn't say just look at the heart with an earthly mindset, but he says look at the heart the way Jesus looked at your heart, right? The, the forgiveness that Jesus extended to you, now you go and extend to others. That same forgiveness, not a similar forgiveness, not a kind of like that forgiveness, but the same forgiveness. In other words, somebody sins, I look at the cross, and I, and I forgive based on the cross, not based on the action, right? And so God tells us that. And so, so the context is God sees the heart, right? And so in Psalm 139, we're able to come to God knowing that He sees the heart and that He sees our heart, right? And that He has forgiveness for us. I'm going to read, I'm going to kind of jump around just for the sake of time, but... I'm going to read, uh, I'll tell you where, where, where I'm jumping to. But uh, Psalms 139, I'm going to read verse 1 through 6. Psalm 139 says, O Lord, you have examined my heart, and you know everything about me. Verse 2 says, You know when I sit down or stand up, you know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel, and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. Verse 4, you know, what, what, you know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. Verse 5, you go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. 
Verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. So we start off with this, declaring how God sees everything about us. So there is no excuse. There is no need to explain to God why we did what we did or why we've held on to what we've held on to. There's no reason to explain. God already understands it. So we come to God. You know my heart. You know me, Lord. And then we jump to verse 17. Right from six. And if you read it through, it's just going to be... Uh, just expounding on that. I'm not skipping anything um, because it's irrelevant. It's just for time's sake. But you can read through it all. Verse 17 says, How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. And then jumping down to verse 23. right? This is a, my prayer. And this is what I believe our prayer should be. Right, so, so before I read it, understanding that we know that God sees everything. There's nothing hidden from God. And I remember when I first came to the Lord, when I first heard the gospel, that was the thing that, that impacted me, was the picture of God and, and how big He was and, and what a great, holy, perfect God He was and the light that came from God and then me and, and my sin and, and, and who, how little I was compared to this great, mighty God and, and understanding it, that He was beyond good, that He was beyond right, beyond righteousness, that He was just perfect, and that I was so imperfect. And I remember seeing that picture. And then so, so seeing God, who He is, and how, he, how there's no excuse, how there's nothing we can say, how nothing we've ever done or thought can be hidden from God, we say in verse 23, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And verse 24 says, Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. You know, we talk about how God sees everything and how God knows everything, but the Word of God says that we have access to that knowledge that God has. And we should be asking God, show me my heart as I walk through this. Show me my heart, Lord. Am I, is there anything that needs attention? Do I need to bring things to you? And a lot of times, God will show us things that we didn't even know were there. And when He does, it doesn't mean, okay, there's something. All right, God, you know, take it away. A lot of times, it means we need to act on it. A lot of times it means we need to call somebody. So you won't forgive me for this. They might not even know what you're calling. They might not even know what you're talking about. But we're not doing it for them. We're doing it for us. Because we need to deal with that part of our hearts. We need to deal with that until it's done. If you're like me, when God saved you, when God changed your heart, He not only changed you from the inside, but that inside work started to manifest on the outside. You started to make different decisions. You started to do things different. You stopped doing certain things. You started doing other things. It's the same way. Every time God changes our heart, something has to change. Right? If we've been living with unforgiveness, with hurt, with bitterness, with different things in our hearts, all of that, believe it or not, it's affected us. You might not think it has, but it has. And so certain decisions you've made, certain things that you've done, it have been because you're walking with that. So when that gets taken away, things start to change. And a lot of times we need to start from calling somebody saying, forgive me for this. And then, you, then you're cleansed from that. And then you're able to walk, you know, a straighter walk before God. Mm -hmm. right? And it's not because God is saying you're not walking straight enough. It's because God is saying, I have victory for you. I have victory for you. And my desire is for you to walk in that. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let's close the prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Your love for us isn't a, a passive love. Your love for us isn't a permissive love. It's a love that looks at our heart and sees us for who we really are and still loves us and still blesses us and still believes in us. Father, I pray that you help us 
to believe in those that have hurt us, Father, to believe that they can change, to believe that they can be somebody else, Father. Believe that you can work in their hearts, Lord God. Father, help us to see our need for our uh, repentance before you, Lord God. Jesus, I thank you for going to the cross and dying for my sins so that I can walk righteous before God, not because of my actions, but because of your actions. And I can walk in forgiveness, being forgiven and forgiving others, Lord. I thank you for that, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that as a church, that we turn to you, Father, and that we turn away from everything that doesn't please you, Lord God. And that we get through this time, Father God, in victory. You've made a mockery of the devil in all his works, Lord God. We pray that that would be evident in our lives. The devil has no hold on us. We speak defeat to every work of the enemy. We speak it in Jesus' name. And we turn to you, Lord God. We turn our hearts to you, Father. I thank you for all of those who have never given their life to the Lord before today, that through this message, that they would hear your loving heart, Lord God, that they would hear your forgiveness, Lord God, and they would come to you, Father, and seek that forgiveness, Lord God. Turn from their wicked ways, Father God, and receive from you a clean and pure heart, Father. We praise you for all these things, Lord. We pray in your name, Jesus. Hallelujah.